Remember when the Magi came to Jerusalem, when the late Walter Martin said, uh, we've seen his star in the east at its rising. We've come to find the Messiah. What did the religious, the scribes do? They pulled out the scriptures. They didn't look at the stars to determine where the Messiah is going to be born. Welcome, everybody, to our weekly program as I'm here with Don Stewart, as we understand how to defend our faith, and what does the Bible really have to say? Because obviously, there's so much misinformation that is out there regarding the Bible. We want to get the truth out there and help you to be able to defend your faith and understand what the Bible is really about. So from educating our world, uh, hey, welcome, Don. Great to have you back again. Thanks for having me, Tom. Always a pleasure. Hey, before we get going, I want to just uh, remind you all, go to educatingourworld.com. That's Don Stewart's homepage. And on there, you're going to find some of the questions that we're addressing today. 66 books, Don, is that correct? 65. Let's not exaggerate, Tom. Six, <laughs> 65 <laughs> books, even downloadable for free. And uh, just fantastic resource, educatingourworld.com. And uh, so we're going to go through some questions right now. And uh, so let's roll. You ready, Don? Let's do it. All right. Uh, question as we're looking at science and the Bible. We've been doing this for a while now. Does the Bible teach that the earth is the center of the universe? You know, that's a great question. One of the problems we have, Tom, is unbelievers want to talk about how unscientific the Bible is. And this is one of the issues they bring up. So I'm glad you're asking that question. This is called geocentrism, meaning basically the earth is the center of the universe and everything revolves around the earth. It's one of common claims of the, against the Bible's design, divine inspiration that it portrays the earth as the immovable center of the solar system. And so that's why people say this is unscientific. Well, let's look first of all at a few passages that seem to say that. I'm gonna read from the King James Bible here. In the First Chronicles 16, 30, it says, he has fixed the earth firm, immovable. All right, the Psalmist also wrote about the earth being immovable and firm in Psalm 93, one. Thou hast fixed the earth immovable and firm, Psalm 96, 10. He has fixed the earth firm, immovable. Now, also, we read about unshakable foundations of the earth, like a foundation. Thou hast didst fix the earth on its foundation so that it can never be shaken, Psalm 104, 5, etc. All right, so it is claimed these passages teach that the earth is immovable or fixed as the fixed center of the universe. And also, we read how the sun rises and sets. Exodus 22, 3, but it happened after sunrise. If it happens after sunrise, he is guilty of bloodshed. So they write about the sun rising. And then in Deuteronomy 16, 6, they talk about the sun going down. Do this in the evening as the sun sets at the same time of day you departed from Egypt. All right, so here's the argument, Tom. Since the sun neither rises nor sets, and the earth is not based fixed on some immovable object, we're supposedly having an unscientific description of the solar system. And the question, of course, is how could this come from an all-knowing God? Uh, because Earth is not the center of the solar system. It's not standing on something else. What's going on? Okay. A bunch of way to, ways we answer that. First, the critics who contend that the people in the ancient world, including the writers of the Bible, held erroneous views such as a flat Earth, that the Earth was the true center of the universe, that the sun actually rises and sets, as well as the moon self-generates its own light, make the mistake of assuming that statements which are made by observation are attempting to state scientific facts. And here's the key. In fact, the Bible was written for all people of all ages. In other words, it was not a Posed to give us technical scientific explanations for 21st century humanity. That's why the Bible's language is not scientific or unscientific, it's non-scientific, the way you and I speak. So what we have here, Tom, from Scripture is the language of a parent. From our view, the earth stays one place and the sun revolves around the earth, right? And of course, uh, that's not incorrect to say that from our observation point of view. The sun rises and sets as far as we're concerned, but we know better than that, that again, the sun is stationary and the earth is what moves. But here's the thing too, Watch your evening uh, report tonight, the weather report. The, the uh, weather person will say, and the sun sets here in Southern California at 502. Well, the sun doesn't set at 502, does it, Tom? It, it really doesn't. We, we move around to the sun at, by 502 where, he, you know, the sun's gone. So bottom line is, if you see it from 
the perspective of an observer, and then realize one other thing, and this is crucial. The earth is center of God's plan in the universe. He's, you know, this is where he's put humanity. This is where the son of God came. So from that perspective, it is the center of the universe, but not physically where it just stays still and everything revolves around it. Excellent point. Uh, just thinking about the weather, man. Absolutely. We're going to see it. Pick up the paper. You go to your app. Sun yep. sets, sun rises. That's yep. what everybody says. Uh, next question, and, and I've been hearing this for years, uh, different dynamics about it. We go back to the book of Genesis where we have the stars, the moon, and the sun that are created. We have lights in the sky given to us uh, to know the seasons and so forth. Uh, so the question is this, is the gospel found in the stars? Of course, we think of the Magi, something they saw that uh, caused them to come from the east and uh, to the area where the Messiah was born. But is the gospel found in the stars? A great question. It's, it's a question that's often brought up and actually an issue that's often proclaimed. Uh, in fact, in our book, Resolving Scientific Difficulties, this is question number 28 for people that want to download it for free and read it. It's also called the Maseroth. That's how it's pronounced, is the gospel found in the stars. Now, here's a little bit of background. We went into quite a bit of detail in this. And now let me read you what I wrote. It's been asserted that the entire story of the gospel of Jesus Christ was actually portrayed in the stars. It has been claimed that the constellations present God's truth to the world in vivid form. This is known as the Maseroth. The initial work was done by a 19th century woman named Frances Rolleston, became popular uh, in America through the work of Bible commentator J.A. Sice, and in England through the writings of E.W. Bullinger. Here's the th theory, Tom. Here's how it goes. The basic idea is that God's message had been revealed in the pattern of the stars. It could have come from God himself who revealed these patterns and their exact meaning to the early inhabitants on the earth. There is also the thought that some of the early people named the various constellations in an effort to preserve for the world what they knew about God's plan of salvation. All this would have occurred, and here's the idea, it all would have occurred before there's any written revelation from God. In other words, before God had put it, put it into writing, people could look at the stars and get the plan of salvation. They could learn from this. And there are certain parallels, we're told, from ancient mythology that seem to uh, you know, promote this. And the support for the theory is basically this. There is the need, because the interval from the time Adam was created to the first book of the Bible, Moses, 1400 BC, Adam lived some 4,000 4, to 5,000 years before the time of Christ, and about 3,500 years before the time of Moses. So you got 3,500 years where there's no writing, it seems. And so how's God going to reveal this truth? And, and the argument is, well, the stars. And the arguments for this, God named the stars, Psalm 147.4, he calls them all by name. The names may have been told to humans, we're told. Um, we fact, Flavius Josephus, the first century writer, claimed that this knowledge was given to one of the sons of Adam, Seth. It's also been speculated that Seth received the names of his father, Adam. Uh, remember, we're told uh, Adam named every beast of the field, Genesis 2, 19 and 20. He named all the animals. And so the idea, it's possible there that uh, God told him the name of the stars also to get the gospel message in the stars. And we read such things as the message of the stars is proclaimed in the sky, that Paul cited the message to illustrate the gospel and the stars. He says, the voice of God's gone out through all the earth. And so the names of the stars supposedly preach the gospel. That's a real quick introduction to it. Okay, here's the problem. First of all, one, number one, we're never told in Scripture that God informed humans the names of the stars. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the purpose of the stars was what? To separate the day from the night, the service signs to mark seasons, days, and years. Nothing about the gospel message. We are never told to search the stars for um, answers. The name of, and the name of the stars don't preach the gospel. Now, here's the thing. Uh, let me go. Let's go back. We talk about this in our, our explanation of the book of Genesis here too, Tom, uh, and our questions on that. That it's very likely that God had writing from the very beginning. The, the story of the creation, the story of Adam and Eve, could have been written by Adam himself. Genesis 2, 4, these are the generations of Adam and Eve. That could have been penned by Adam. And, he, you know, they put it on some type of permanent, um, you know, whatever. And then the next person comes along, uh, Noah, et cetera, et cetera. The bottom line is there's no problem with God. You know, uh, Moses got a bunch of tablets from the beginning by people who were there. So we weren't without divine revelation from the very beginning. So that is a quick answer to a very complicated question. And here's the here's the, the, the key. And I'll, I'm sorry, I talk so long, but I'll end with this. 
Remember when the Magi came to Jerusalem, when the late Walter Martin said, uh, we've seen his star in the east at its rising. We've come to find the Messiah. What did the religious, the scribes do? They pulled out the scriptures. They didn't look at the stars to determine where the Messiah is going to be born. So that kind of says it all. Yeah, ex uh, very good. Thank you, Don. Next question, why did God restrict the children of Israel from eating certain foods? Um, you know, I've been to Israel many times um, and celebrated Shabbat with some of my Jewish friends. And, uh, you know, so we have these kosher rules. In fact, I mean, you know, Don, you go to Israel, you're going to be in a hotel, you're going to have kosher rules. Uh, most yeah. of the restaurants follow them. Even if they're not really followers of God, you're still going to have these kosher laws, these dietary rules. Why is that? Yeah, this is a real interesting question. Why did God restrict the children of Israel from eating certain foods? Now, this has been answered a number of different ways. Some people argue it was hygiene. In other words, one of the popular explanations, the food was given to Israel mainly for hygienic purposes. We know that humans should avoid eating the carcasses of dead animals or eating animals that have died of natural causes. Certainly animals that God calls unclean, which is real interesting, are known to transfer disease to humans. There's no doubt about this. However, and here's the key, it's not true of all unclean animals in the list. Some, some animals whom the Israelites were not allowed to eat have no known association with disease. The camel, for example. I don't know. Have you had a camel you ever, Tom, to eat? <laughs> no, I've, I've never, never eaten a camel. <laughs> or or, sm or smoke. I, I, maybe, maybe, maybe. I didn't even <laughs> do that when I was younger. Cigarettes, okay. Anyway. <laughs> well, not people. camels. <laughs> it's a weird, if you did, yeah, same here. I know it was the funny stuff. I know. Uh, the camel re remains a delicacy for Arabs to this day. Further, there's no known the scientific evidence that the camel somehow passes disease to humans. God forbade the nation of Israel to eat pork. Well, raw pork is certainly not safe to eat, and uncooked pork can cause health problems. Pork was a staple diet of Israel's neighbors. It seemed like they learned to prepare it. We can go on and on and on about the clean and unclean things. Okay, what it seems to be is that there were certain nations that were would eat certain foods and not eat certain foods. And God wanted Israel to be distinct, wanted to be separate. So remember Deuteronomy 18, 9, it says, when they enter the promised land, don't worry the ways of the heathens. So there's already laws they had in place, what to eat, what not to eat. God did want, wanted Israel to be different. So what he did, even though some of the unclean animals could have been eaten safely, God said, no, this is unclean. Why? Because these nations considered it some type of religious ritual or clean to eat. So basically, that seems to be the best answer, uh, that, that they're to keep separate from the pagan nations around them, the pagan influence, and therefore, they weren't to eat certain things, because these things were also sacrificed to idols, too. And that's why a pig meat, for example, neighboring pagan tribes would offer a pig as a sacrifice to God. That's why... Israel was forbidden to eat pig meat. And so the idea is, and, and here's a real important point, Tom, and I'll end with this. God wanted Israel to be separate, distinct from every nation. And since there were already practices in place about sacred food, about you know offering this type of food to, to God, their gods, God wanted Israel to be distinct. So it seems that the answer is not so much hygienic as it is just that Israel would stand out as a unique nation, unique to God. Mm, thank you very much. I have one more question for you. I won't ask sure. you this in just a second. Did the sun actually stand still in Joshua's long day? But before we get to this question, folks, I just want to remind you, uh, check out Don Stewart's website, educatingourworld.com. And also don't forget to like, share, and subscribe our channels. It helps us to be able to get the truth out there. It's the only way we can get it out there is with your sharing. And also uh, be sure that you... Um, uh, ring the bell for notifications when we have a new video. Okay, with that done, last question. Did the sun actually stand still on Joshua's long day? Well, the sun doesn't move, so it would, it did, but that's not what the the, the account is, that as the, the it seemed to be a, either a prolonged day or a prolonged night, that's the thing. Now, here's the key, and we give like seven different possibilities to it. We could take all episode and deal with that if you wanted to. But it was a miracle. Whatever happened that day was a miracle because Joshua was fighting a battle there uh, against the uh, Amorites, and the Lord had to deliver the Amorites into his hand. So it said he prayed to the Lord in Joshua 10, 12, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stood motionless while the nation took vengeance on the enemies. And we've got, we're told that this is recorded in the book of Yashar or the scroll of the upright one. So it's something that the whole world observed at that time. It seemed the day was lengthened 
in some sense. How it happened is that, you know, again, there's like seven different views and we don't have time to get into them. But the point is it was a miracle and Joshua got the battle, won the victory. Tell you what, I'm gonna make you a deal. How about next time we visit just this one question, let's work through it. A lot of people Great. wonder about that. How could that possibly be? So folks, that's what we'll do next time. We'll take on just that one question. Did the sun stand still? Listen, thank you everybody for joining us. Be sure to check out Don's website, educatingourworld.com. He has a wealth of information out there for you and it's all for free right in one place. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. See you next time and we will find out more about the sun standing still in the day of Joshua. God bless.